Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to What I Tell My Patients, New Treatments and Clinical Trials in Oncology. This is a special webinar targeting oncology nurses and a follow-up to the recent Oncology Nursing Society Congress, which we attended and actually presented 10 symposia, and we're doing some additional ones as webinars of following these meetings. Today, we're gonna to be talking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We have a great faculty, Miss um, uh, Kristen Batato uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and Dr. Jennifer Wyack from the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center in Columbus, Ohio. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As we always do, we have a one minute pre and post meeting survey for you to take in the chat room. If you take that survey, you'll get a lot more out of this webinar. We'll learn a little bit more about you as well. We do webinars all the time. Uh, most of them are targeting uh, medical oncologists, but nurses are certainly welcome. Next week, we have a, a program going on uh, on Tuesday uh, when higher, higher risk uh, myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, then on Thursday, a program on melanoma, non-melanoma skin cancer. So much going on there. Really uh, looking forward to hear what they have to say. And then on July the 18th, we'll be talking about bispecific antibodies. You're seeing more and more of that in oncology. Uh, on the 18th, we'll be talking about the use of bispecifics in multiple myeloma. Then on the 20th, we'll be doing a program on uh, breast cancer. This was on ER positive metastatic disease. So much going on with new agents and strategies there. Uh, then on the 25th, we'll be doing continuing our series on soft tissue sarcomas and related connective tissue disorders. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars because it's very convenient. If you're into audio programs, check out our Oncology Today podcast series, including a program on CLL with uh, Dr. John Allen. Uh, these were the 10 programs that we did on a variety of tumor types uh, at the ONS meeting. We've been going to ONS for about 15 years. Uh, we've always tried to provide a research update to nurses and talk a little bit about uh, talking to patients about it. Uh, we did a post the ONS the webinar on urothelial bladder cancer in May. Uh, and then uh, in June, uh, we did a program on uh, GI cancers. Our themes in the uh, ONS series have always been new agents, new clinical research, and talking to patients about it. But we go a lot beyond that and particularly getting into biopsychosocial issues. And in particular, the theme that we've always had at ONS, which is how is it different to take care of this patient as opposed to another patient with the same oncology situation, but a different person, different age, comorbidities, social situation, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get into that, particularly because today, really, we're just going to make rounds. So uh, Kristen and I met uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, she pulled out uh, four cases from her practices. We talked about it and decided to, that this is the way we're going to present here these today. And uh, this case-based approach really, again, is what we've been doing at ONS for a long time. But before we get into that, I want to ask Jennifer, you know, even I can think back in med school, I always loved artwork, you know, that tried to explain, you know, how things work. And one of the things we're going to be talking about are the new novel agents that have come and really revolutionized the treatment of this disease, Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, so-called BTK, and also venetoclax, which we'll get into. But Jennifer, this paper just came out. It's about a new BTK inhibitor just recently approved this year. We'll talk about later called pertubrutinib. But the thing I thought was really cool was their artwork. So I just want to spend a minute or two and let you uh, sort of walk through this and ask both of you about this. Uh, Kristen, I thought this first graphic is really going to relate to the first patient you're going to present because that patient, as you're going to talk about, started out with a, a white count of 250,000, which is pretty high. And then when you started ebrutinib, a BTK inhibitor, it went up to over 500,000. And we'll hear a little bit more about that. But can you talk a little bit, Jennifer, about sort of the dynamics of CLL, uh, particularly in terms of the transit between the, the blood and lymph tissue and how it might apply to a patient who gets a spike in a white count? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, this is some really cool artwork from the uh, this editorial um, showing how CLL cells kind of recirculate between the blood and the lymph nodes. And you can kind of think about it um, even in a similar way for the bone marrow and spleen too. So CLL cells, as you know, kind of exist everywhere. So very different than a lung cancer or a breast cancer where the bulk of the tumor is in one place and then something makes it go to another place. CLL cells from the time um, that they first start are going to be in the blood and the lymph nodes in the bone marrow. And the cells themselves have certain receptors on their surface, um, specifically here CD5 and CXCR4, um, that help with that homing to the lymph nodes. There's a lot of other molecules that play roles too, things like integrins, um, that, that make the CLL cells want to stick in the lymph nodes and then once they get there, start to proliferate and then continue to stay there. And then at points in time, those receptors kind of downregulate and the cells start to go back out into the circulation. And this is a really important concept in CLL, both because it sort of explains why some people's disease is different. So some people have disease more in their lymph nodes because of these homing and um, adhesion mechanisms and because of the proliferation that occurs in the lymph nodes. And some people actually have almost all blood-based disease where they really just don't have a lot of um, disease in the lymph nodes. And one of the major classes of drugs we use that you mentioned, the BTK inhibitors, one of the things that they do besides stopping the signaling inside the CLL cells, they actually inhibit these factors that make the cells want to stick in the lymph nodes. It disrupts their homing to the lymph nodes and it disrupts their adhesion. And so when you give a drug like a BTK inhibitor, all those cells that were initially um, had all these signals that made them stay in the lymph nodes, all that signaling gets released all at once. And those cells that were sitting in the lymph nodes disengage and go back into the peripheral circulation before they die. So I'm curious, uh, Kristen, uh, you know, our theme here is what I tell my patients. I'm curious, you know, you don't have a slide or maybe you use slides like this with your patient. But how do you, when you have a patient who's panicking, like your patient you're going to talk about in a second, how do you explain this phenomenon to patients? I think this is a most one of the most important things you're going to tell patients when you're starting a BTK inhibitor because if you if they you know come in for their weekly lab after you start a BTK inhibitor and they see that their white blood cell count is doubled they panic um, you know they think that they're rapidly progressing through the new therapy and and you can get a very panicked patient on the phone um, you know or in, and you want to avoid that so I think this is really essential an essential part of the patient's education when you're counseling them on you know what happens when it, you're starting a BTK inhibitor and what to expect. And it's also important to counsel them that this will, this will plateau and resolve and come down. You know, as these cells, again, as Dr. Wojak said, they push out of the, the, the spleen, the lymphocytes, the bone marrow, they're going to circulate and the body will naturally just kill them off and excrete them. And their, and their white blood cell does eventually normalize with time. It can take a couple of weeks Sometimes with patients with, at, with significant disease bulk, it can even take months and you just have to reassure them. So there were also a couple of graphics uh, in terms of the mechanism of action of these drugs. Before you talk about that, though, Jennifer, can you kind of put in perspective? We know like about a third of our audience has been in oncology less than 10 years. And really, this whole thing has only been going on really clinically for about that period of time. Yep. Can you talk about kind of how we treated CLL before this? And when we moved, uh, you know, I remember people talking about we'll, we'll be able to treat them without chemo and nobody believed that could even be possible. And now we're there. Um, can you talk a little bit about your vision of how these amazing drug works? I remember Ibrutinib was the first one that came in. And I think people still have a, a real attachment to that drug because of what they saw as it came in. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like before and how it changed? Yeah. So prior to ibrutinib, um, and actually I, ibrutinib wasn't the first targeted agent that was used in CLL. Idololisib, a PI3 kinase inhibitor, actually was um, used even before ibrutinib. But, you know, obviously ibrutinib has worked better and is less toxic. So that really has stood the test of time. But prior to those types of drugs, chemotherapy was really the mainstay for treatment. Chemotherapy with an antibody and usually the CD20 antibody 
rituximab. And so, you know, that was hard for patients. Many of these, most of these patients are older. Many of them have other comorbid medical conditions. Sometimes their kidney function isn't great. Sometimes their liver function isn't great. And, you know, these drugs made people not feel well. Um, those that were working full time would have to be on disability. People wouldn't be able to spend a lot of time with their grandkids and travel and do other things that they wanted. Um, there was lots of clinical trials and, uh, you know, we at um, Ohio State, I think at Memorial Sloan Kettering, many other places that did a lot of clinical trials. We had lots of patients that, that participated in many studies and people would go kind of from study to study and get uh, six months of remission, maybe nine months of remission if they were lucky. And that was life for many people with CLL until these drugs came along. And then we started giving people ibrutinib and all of a sudden these people who were used to having six month remission durations or even less were going years with their disease being treated. They were feeling well, they were able to be with their families, go out with their friends, work, travel, and it was just really game changing. And so, you know, there's been obviously a lot of progress since then too with the second generation BTK inhibitors with with venetoclax um, and every one of these is, um, additions has really continued to improve the quality of life for CLL patients. I'm curious too, Kristen, you know, you're in a very unusual sit. Both of you really are because your clinics are, you know, almost all CLL and you see a huge compared to, you know, a typical oncology clinic in the United States, you probably see like a hundred times more CLL patients. What's it like in your waiting room there? Is it, you know, I'm not going to call it a well baby clinic because most of these people are probably pretty old, but uh, uh, what do you see in terms of quality of life? I guess when you came into oncology was when this was all kind of getting started, right, Kristen? Uh, yeah, I joined the outpatient practice in 2019, um, which was really a really exciting time. Um, it's funny, we laugh. It's um, our patients, we keep accumulating patients. They don't go anywhere because they live really long, a really long life. It's not like you're acute acute clinic with an acute leukemia with these patients tend to have more uh, poor prognos prognostic uh, pathway. Um, so it, it's a good problem to have. Um, and, you know, and there continues to be really exciting clinical trials and um, new drug combinations and new drugs, mechanisms of actions to target CLL. And um, I'm very, I'm very grateful to work in this field. And I'm really, um, I'm really excited by what's to come. So uh, it's a good problem to have. Um, and our, our patients are very, very grateful for the work that we do. And uh, uh, and we appreciate them because they're they're good participants and they they're um they're they're a lot of them are eager and willing to participate in clinical trials and add to the work that needs to be done so uh jennifer maybe you can talk a little bit about your vision of how btk and here we'll get to venetoclax later but about about how btk inhibitors work and particularly some of the new btk inhibitors that are coming along with slightly different mechanisms mm -hmm. so um, btk inhibitors the reason that they work is because BTK is really a critical signaling molecule inside the CLL cells. So CLL cells are really dependent on the B cell receptor signaling pathway, and they, they kind of hijack this normal pathway to create signals that make the cells divide, make them, like I said, stick in the lymph nodes, um, and make them not die. And so the way drugs like ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib work, so those are uh, covalent BTK inhibitors or irreversible BTK inhibitors, is they will form a bond with BTK in such a way that the BTK can't get away from the drug. And so that's an irreversible or a covalent bond. And so what that does is it completely shuts down the signaling in the CLL cells. And so all of a sudden, the CLL cell stops doing what it has been doing all along. And, you know, in addition to leaving the lymph nodes, um, in addition to stopping proliferating, it also stops secreting inflammatory proteins called cytokines, which tend to make people not feel very good. And so, you know, the patients tend to feel well relatively quickly because the, that cytokine production stops too. So, you know, those drugs, they work extremely well. Almost everybody responds. Remission durations can be you know, over five years in many patients. Um, but what will happens over time is many people will develop resistance. And usually resistance develops because the CLL cell mutates that BTK protein such that that covalent or irreversible bond with the drug can't form anymore. 
And usually this is, a, if you remember back to, um, back to organic chemistry classes, it's a cysteine to serine mutation in the binding site. And so now because that mutation is there, the drug can bind, but it binds reversibly. So it binds like for seven minutes rather than forever. Um, and it doesn't bind as efficiently either. So those drugs stop working. So now um, there are a number of drugs in a class called reversible or non-covalent BTK inhibitors, pure tobrutin like we talked about, there's another one called nemtabrutinib, and there's even others in clinical trials that don't have names yet. And the way those drugs work is they actually bind to a different site within the kind of the active, um, the active part of BTK that is the ATP binding site. Um, but they, they don't use that same binding site that ibrutinib does. So even in the presence of a mutation, those other drugs can still come in and be active. Um, and we've seen in clinical trials that, that these drugs are really active, even even in patients who progressed after taking ibrutinib or acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib, and that specifically pirtabrutinib is extremely well tolerated too. And, you know, I think this one is poised to be another game changer in CLL. So, and of course, one of the problems, and actually you see the same thing with tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are used in so many situations in oncology, is they not only affect uh, the tumor cells, but they can affect normal tissue as well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit in more detail, but sort of globally, Kristen, uh, when you think about some of the uh, other you know, side effects that you see with BTK inhibitors, what are some of the common things that you see because of the fact that they do not only focus just on the cancer cells? Yeah, they, they inhibit other kinases, which is something you have to look out for. So depending on the BTK inhibitor, um, basically a class effect we see is bleeding. There's always going to be a bleeding risk. So it's really important to counsel patients if they're going to undergo any kind of surgical procedure. Depending on what that surgical procedure is, there will be a specific hold time. And just to kind of, and just to um, encourage patients to report when they're going in for surgeries, such as a colonoscopy with or without a biopsy, that could be a smaller, a shorter hold uh, interval when compared to like a more like bloody procedure with like, a, like an orthopedic procedure like a hip or a knee replacement that's a full seven day before and seven day after so patients just have to know to call and talk to you and you know and plan that out accordingly um, we also see a class effect of hypertension and a lot of the btk inhibitors um, sometimes this can be a late effect that we see patients who have been on btk inhibitors for years their blood pressure could creep up over time so it's really important to collaborate with their primary care physician or cardiologist and keep an eye on that blood pressure and make sure they're monitoring it. Um, other ones are kind of more specific, um, like uh, abrutinib, we can see some dermal toxicity with rash or muscle cramping, arthralgias or myalgias initially. Um, acalabrutinib, we see a lot of tension headaches, usually in the first six to eight weeks of starting therapy. Um, easily managed, it's not life altering. Um, usually just telling people um, to have another cup of coffee or increase their caffeine consumption in, or even Tylenol or ibuprofen will help alleviate the headache. Um, good hydration, they're usually on their way by by midday and they forget about it. Um, uh, with a zanubrutinib, we see there's a lot of neutropenia, so that's something we have to monitor for and support pa uh, patients with growth factors as needed. So it kind of depends on the BTK inhibitor, but the class effect we see is definitely that bleeding precaution, that hypertension, um, and, um, and, 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 it kind of, and it kind of can vary as you kind of weed off um, with, the, with the second and first generation BTK inhibitors. So, you know, the two CLL programs that you both are part of are two of the largest, most important clinical research centers in CLL in the world. And you've seen, as you were saying, Kristen, you had so many trials. So just the introduction of BTK would have been a huge, it was a huge benefit. But then not that long after, we had another strategy coming in, the drug venetoclax, often given with an anti-CD20 antibody. And Jennifer, this was different in that the BTK inhibitors had to be used indefinitely, although they're generally well tolerated. But now with venetoclax, the way it was used was short term. The patient got treated for a year or two and then it was stopped and they were observed. And we'll get into the fact that now you create a situation where you have a real choice for patients that's dramatically different, a completely different approach. We'll talk at the end that when clinical research trials, we're even combining now venetoclax and BTK. But Jennifer, just to sort of get it out on the table, again, your vision of how venetoclax works and how you explain it to patients. 
Yeah, so venetoclax um, is a uh, BCL2 inhibitor. It, um, and so BCL2 is an anti-apoptotic protein. So many types of cancer, including CLL, uh, will upregulate BCL2 in order to have that immortality of the CLL cells. And one of the ways that uh, that this happens is so BCL2 will bind to and kind of sequester the proteins that are involved in apoptosis or that programmed cell death. And so those proteins are sequestered with the BCL2 and they can't do anything. And so what venetoclax does is it binds to BCL2 and displaces those anti-apoptotic protein or those apoptotic proteins that were being sequestered and allows the cell to undergo programmed cell death. Um, and so when that happens, the cells actually die very quickly. So it's really different than the BTK inhibitors where um, they stop doing their CLL job, uh, but it takes weeks to months for them to actually die. And with a drug like venetoclax, the cells die right away. And so one of the things that we watch out for with that type of drug is tumor lysis syndrome just because of that quick cell death. And we know that when, when those drugs are given with the CD20 antibodies, either obinutuzumab or rituximab, um, that even more quickly kills the CLL cells. And, you know, like you, like you mentioned, the result of that is actually people can get remissions that are minimal residual disease or MRD undetectable. So no matter how hard you look, like you can look in the, at the lymph nodes by CAT scan, you can look in the blood and even in the bone marrow and can't find any evidence of CLL. And so that allows people to actually come off the drug and hopefully that they can be off the drug for long periods of time. And it also really created one of the most interesting decisions in oncology and continues to be nowadays, which is which direction you're going to go, Kristen. Are you going to go on an indefinite therapy that's a pill, an oral pill, and often well tolerated, particularly the newer second generation agents? Or are you going to kind of, quote, get it over with in a year and go through something that might be a little bit more of a hassle? Uh, but you get through and then hopefully you can be observed without any treatment for a long period of time. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you see this? And you see this every day. Most in oncology clinics is going to happen every three or four months. But uh, I'm curious how you see people processing, I think, what people view as you know, equal decisions that really relate to, I don't know, I guess lifestyle and, and how you view it. I'm curious what you observed. And the other thing I want you to relate is all this was starting to come together just as COVID got here. And you in New York were really the first place, among the first place in the United States uh, to be hit by COVID. I remember talking to you and all your colleagues and of course everybody else about that. I'm curious how that, during that time, uh, how people were making their decisions compared to, for example, today. Yeah, I left out one co um, AE adverse event for uh, BTK inhibitors, uh, atrial fibrillation, apologies. So that is something right. we look for That's with BTK inhibitors we'll and a very important one. Yeah, sorry about that. But anyway, to answer your questions, Dr. Love, um, yeah, it's it's very much a shared decision making at times when patients come into the office and they're requiring therapy and you're looking at, you know, your two pillars of treatment. You have your BTK inhibitors and your venetoclax-based therapy. Um, you know, we know they're, they're very active in even and higher risk genomic features. So it, you have two really good options. And what I often tell my patients is if you're not going to get, um, you know, one in the upfront setting, you're going to eventually, well, you'll eventually see it, you know, because then it's given, it's given in the relapse refractory setting. And we know that they both work very well in both the frontline and the relapse refractory setting. Um, so when patients come in and it kind of depends on their, you know, their social situation and how they're doing and what they're, um, and what, and what their, what their approach is going to be. I have a lot of patients saying, I want to eradicate my disease. I want to have, achieve MRD undetectability. I don't want any circulating CLL cells that I can, that, that are detectable. And I want to, you know, irradiate this. So let's just get rid of it. Let's, you know, and, and that's, and that's a pathway in which we're going to utilize venetoclax obinutuzumab. But it's important that they understand that it, it is quite a commitment. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a five week ramp up with, um, and basically you're coming in for labs and, and close monitoring weekly for up to three months and then it spaces out a little bit. So it, it is a large commitment on the patient's um, behalf and they have to come in and they need to stay for the labs and there's no way out of it. We have to follow the FDA label and they have to be willing and able to do that. Um, so that's one of the things you have to really make sure that they consider um, and they're willing and able to do. 
Um, I have a funny story. I had a guy try to skip out on his uh, six hour post labs uh, to go to Kinky Boots a couple years ago. And I was you know, having an, a Broadway <laughs> argument. It's, I guess it's a New York issue to have. And I, and I was like, yeah, not, not a good day to buy Kinky Boots tickets, you know. Um, so um, so that, you know, that's, that's the, I use that example to bring humor, but you know, that even Kinky Boot tickets, you have to stay, you know. Um, <laughs> so um, that's one thing. Um, with respect to COVID, it was, it was definitely a very challenging time because we know obinutuzumab is very B cell depleting and, you know, and we're, we're, you don't want to immunosuppress people more during that, that very trying time. So it was very, it was very much, a, you know, a challenging time um, where patients were, you know, immunocompromised and quite sick. Um, but, you know, as, you know, as we've kind of veering out of the COVID, um, you know, pandemic, we've been utilizing this regimen uh, very heavily again. I'm curious, Jennifer, what your perception is about how people process this decision. I've heard people say, you know, they present a patient, you know, who's, most of these people are older, but they'll present a patient who's 60 and say, oh, they're younger, they want to get it over with. But I wonder whether older people want to get it over with as well. What's your, what do you observe and how people process, how families process this really critical decision, Jennifer? Yeah, and everybody has different priorities and, you know, different ways that they make this decision. And, um, yeah, we always think that it's the younger patients that want time-limited therapy. But, as you say, many older patients, you know, they say, hey, I want to take a trip next year. I really want to be off therapy for it. Can we do venetoclexib and agizumab and get me off treatment? And I also see younger patients who they, look, I actually don't have the time off work to come in and do the venetoclex ramp up or to do the obinutuzumab infusions, give me the pill so that I don't have to miss work and don't have to miss other things. So, you know, for, for most people, the regimens are fairly equivalently effective. And so we talk a lot about side effects. We talk a lot about, you know, that trade-off between the indefinite and the time-limited therapy. And, you know, every everybody really does just have their own priorities in terms of that decision. So we're going to get into sort of how this actually plays out in the real world. Just to make one other point, you mentioned MRD, minimal residual disease. And the fact that uh, with a lot of these therapies, particularly as you mentioned, the venetoclax-based therapy, you can get to a point where you don't see anything, but of course that doesn't mean that it's gone, uh, yeah. but, but it certainly means that there's very good chance that it's not gonna be a problem for quite a while. And it's really amazing we've gotten to a point where you can do an assay like that, let alone have agents that can really put patients in that state. All right, let's talk about, you, you know, it's all well and good. You know, you sit in a classroom or whatever lecture hall and you hear how the theory, but let's get into the actual practice. Each one of these is, an, is a different story. Uh, starting out with this 73-year-old uh, retired school teacher. Uh, Kristen, can you talk a little bit? I guess she, she first presented in 2015. Uh, what was, what's it been like taking care of her? She's actually been on Ibrutinib now, I guess. She's the patient we were talking about who had the big bump in the white count. So can you talk a little bit about this case, please? Sure. Um, so she was, um, she presented to our clinic. She was being observed for quite some time. And, she, and then she eventually developed symptomatic splenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. Um, she lives about two hours north of our, um, of the city up in the Catskills. <clears throat> and she's caring for her 90 year old mother. Um, so that was definitely a transportation barrier and lifestyle barrier that we had to navigate through. <clears throat> so we decided to treat her with a BTK inhibitor just for convenience, uh, and she didn't mind the continuity and the continuous therapy. So we went ahead and started her on a brutinib monotherapy, um, and she did she and, and she hit some routine road bumps that we see with the brutinib therapy. And the, initially, she had some really significant muscle and joint aches, arthralgias or myalgias, what we can see initially the first couple of weeks to months while on BTK therapy. And we were trying to get her through that with supportive care, um, you know, and then said acetaminophen, topical Voltaren. He Eating pads, um, and it was really it was really persistent after about three months of therapy. So after about three months, we decided to give her a brief drug hold. We held it for about seven days, and and just a brief hold kind of reset these um, these muscle and joint aches. And she was able to tolerate the abrutinib at full dose, so we didn't have to dose reduce her, which was great. Um, so we got her through that. Um, I do want to highlight her laboratory um, uh, situation. So uh, again, we counseled her on that redistribution of the lymphocytosis. Um, so we started. So when she started therapy, her, her white blood cell count was kind of um, leveling out at between 250 to 300,000, and and about. 
four to six weeks after starting a brutinib therapy, she peaked at about 530,000. So she had a really significant redistribution, which can be quite alarming. It took us uh, it took a lot of reassuring her that this is normal, it was going to plateau, and it was going to normalize. And it eventually did after about four to six months of therapy, her white count normalized, and it's um, and it's been there ever since. Um, she's been free. Of, and one way you can kind of see to make sure patients, this isn't progressive disease, is are their lymph nodes shrinking? Are they starting to feel a little bit better? Is their spleen receding? slowly? Um, are they eating more? Um, that is a good way to assess to see if this is a true uh, response to a drug versus disease progression. Um, so she did overall well. She uh, counts normalized, um, but after a while she developed some muscle cramping at night, which is another AE we can see with the brutinib therapy. So we were able to we, we, we encourage her to stay really well hydrated, and we added on a vitamin B complex and an oral magnesium supplement, which has been shown to help with um, nocturnal muscle cramping. Um, and then lastly, we uh, the last couple of uh, visits she's been coming in, we've seen her uh, blood pressure creeping up, which is a common AE that we see with uh, BTK therapy, hypertension. It can be a late onset effect. Um, so we're collaborating with her primary care physician to up titrate her hypertensive regimen. Um, and, and otherwise she's doing okay. She's in a continued remission. She's been on for about three and a half to four years. Um, the nice thing about her is we're able to keep her close to home with mom and do this from kind of a remote setting. I mean, initially she had to come in for her nodal exams and we, we were kind of um, more fresh on therapy, um, but then we were able to space her out to three month visits and even utilize telehealth and local labs. So this was really a rewarding case to see. So uh, Jennifer, we're like making rounds here and just asking you to generally comment on anything you think would be interesting to talk about. I'm curious about your thoughts about this case. One other thing about this case, I, I don't think you mentioned uh, Kristen was that uh, she had GERD and was on a PPI. And at that time, you know, we were, you were talking about some of the other issues that occur with patients on BTK. Since that time, we've had other uh, BTK inhibitors come out, including uh, calabrutinib, a second generation agent. But a calabrutinib until fairly recently could not be given with a PPI. Then they came up with a formulation uh, that allowed that, and now a lot of people will use a calabrutinib. But this lady, at that point, it wasn't available. And I think that was one of the reasons she actually went on ebrutinib. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is Kristen uh, re um, referred to cardiac issues with BTK inhibitors, both atrial arrhythmias and uh, ventricular. So uh, any comments on the case, on the issue of GERD, uh, and uh, anything else about this case that you uh, might want to comment on? Yeah, this is uh, definitely a, a fairly common clinical scenario in CLL and, and a reason why somebody at this point in time would likely choose a BTK inhibitor over a venetoclax-based regimens. It would be kind of remote location, far from the treating physician, wants to stay home to be able to take care of their mom. Um, the, redistribution lymphocytosis can be really dramatic, as mentioned. And actually, interestingly, in the very first phase one study of ibrutinib and CLL, the first two patients were taken off for progressive disease because of lymphocytosis. And after wow. that, they noticed that, you know, even though these the lymphocyte count was going up, like Kristen said, lymph nodes are shrinking, people are starting to feel better, and it really wasn't disease progression. Um, rarely, if I'm really nervous about this, like say their white count is 600,000 before you start treatment, sometimes we'll use a CD20 antibody with the BTK inhibitor just for that purpose to make it a little less scary to, to see that uh, lymphocytosis. Um, but yeah, usually people feel just fine and it's the counseling can be really helpful so that people don't see their white count and get uh, very nervous about that. Um, and I think it's all, is well, Kristen pointed out, like many of these toxicities that you see, like the arthralgias and myalgias and GERD can happen too. A lot of those things happen early and many of them actually will get better just with time. Um, some things don't, hypertension doesn't, atrial fibrillation tends to happen later, bleeding can happen anytime. Um, but a lot of the side effects, if you can just manage supportively for a few months, actually will get much better. And the second generation BTK inhibitors overall, um, are much better tolerated from the, that regard. What uh, what do you usually do with a patient who develops atrial fibrillation on a BTK inhibitor? I mean, it is much less common with the newer agents, but it can happen with any of these. Uh, what do you usually do? Do you stop it or keep it going? 
So it depends on what drug they were on to begin with. Um, so there's actually plenty of data to say that you can switch from one BTK inhibitor to another and not have recurrence of many toxicities, including atrial fibrillation. So if they started out on ibrutinib, I would switch them to either acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib. Acalabrutinib probably has a little bit higher risk of atrial fibrillation than xanabrutinib, although that's uh, sort of hard to say because the follow-up times are always different. Those drugs have not been compared head-to-head. -head. So if somebody is on acalabrutinib and develops AFib, I would consider switching them to xanabrutinib. Um, you know, if, if they're on xanabrutinib and there's no contraindication to um, going to venetoclax, you could certainly do that. Um, the one thing over time that I think more and more people have started doing, though, is when somebody develops a toxicity that you need to stop the drug, you don't need to switch them right away to the next agent. So if they've been on ibrutinib for four years and are doing well and develop AFib, no need to just put them on to acalabrutinib. You could just stop, wait for disease progression, and then start your next drug. And that, Kristen, also you know, relates to another important issue, which is not every patient with CLL needs to be treated even if from the start. And in fact, most patients get picked up by a lab tests and aren't mm -hmm. treated initially what is it that usually uh, leads to patients being tr treated, Kristen? It's a it's it's a, an array of symptoms that they can have. Um, we look at lymphocyte doubling time, uh, progressive doubling time over a short period of time within two months. Um, <clears throat> that's definitely an indication, but not always. It has to it has to um, it has to be there in addition to other symptoms. Um, progressive or symptomatic splenomegaly where the spleen is um, causing symptomatic like early satiety and people, patients are having unintentional weight loss, um, drenching night sweats, fevers that don't correlate with illness for more than two months, um, bulky or symptomatic lymphadenopathy, um, you know, bulky meaning, you know, five, six, seven centimeters um, and bothersome. Um, it's cosmetically bothersome. It's painful for the patient. Um, so these are just some of the symptoms that, you know, we see that are indications for therapy in order to start therapy. Also cytopenias. Um, if we see the bone marrow start to fail, if the hemoglobin is progressively below 10 or the platelet count is progressively below 100,000 and dropping, um, you know, we see that that's kind of an indication that the CLL cells are crowding out the marrow function and that we need to start therapy in order to clear that out to allow for um, uh, hematopoiesis and um, healthy cell generation. <clears throat> so Jennifer, I think the theme of what I just heard Kristen say was symptoms, 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 symptoms. Uh, but the other issue that sort of people ask about is the disease itself. And uh, Kristen's about to present uh, an 81-year-old woman who is considered high-risk CLL. She had, uh, this patient um, had a so-called T53, a TP53 mutation, DEL17P. Um, but uh, in general, is that an indication to treat, Jennifer, if you have you know, so some of these factors that indicate uh, poor prognosis in the long term, if they're asymptomatic, are you going to treat them just based on these abnormal factors, or are you still going to hold off treatment uh, because they're asymptomatic? Right now, there is not any indication to treat somebody who's asymptomatic, no matter what their risk classification is. There's actually been a number of clinical trials done, and none so far have shown a survival advantage to treating CLL early. Um, there's an ongoing study actually testing this with venetoclax plus obinutuzumab. So um, who knows, maybe that standard will change in the next five years, but right now, no treatment without symptoms. So let's get into this uh, case. This is an older patient, 81 years old, a retired tailor. And as we were just saying, she was uh, actually high risk based on these two factors you see there, TP53 and DEL17P, but she also had a lot of disease in her abdomen. Can you talk a little bit about this uh, woman, Kristen? Yeah, so when she presented to us, she was, you know, meeting criteria for therapy. She was, like you said, very anxious 80-year-old, 81-year-old woman um, who was found to have a large inter-abdominal conglomerate of lymph nodes uh, that was quite, uh, was quite significant. On her outside imaging, it was measuring up uh, about 14 by 8 centimeters. And then, um, and then when we restaged her, um, it, it was, uh, sorry, it was 11 by, four, by 8. And then when we restaged her at MSK, it, it increased to 14 by 8. So um, she had a lot of abdominal bulk. Um, she was also having progressive cytopenias as well. She was slowly becoming anemic and thrombocytopenic. 
she was pretty convinced that she was going to die imminently. You know, you come in with a large mass in your abdomen, you're 80 years old, and, um, and she was just uh, hitting the ceiling, essentially. <laughs> um, so we counseled her, and what we decided to do, given her um, suboptimal prognostic profile with the TP53 mutations and deletion 17P, uh, we decided to start her on a calibrutinib. Um, but we did v uh, deviate a little bit from the label, label in the sense that we started her on one pill once a day. The, 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 the standard dosing is BID, or twice daily dosing because of her age and this large abdominal bulk and we wanted to avoid a hospitalization there's low risk of tumor lysis with btk inhibitors which add to this convenience factor with these um with these uh with this drug class which is great so we went low and slow with her for a month we 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 monitor her labs weekly we gave her iv hydration I started her on an anti-uracemic agent, allopurinol, and she did really well. She had your usual tension headaches um, in the beginning, which we, you know, uh, navigated with the acetaminophen and hydration and a little, another extra coffee and a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, and then we were able to uptitrate her to two pills a day. Um, and then we, we obtained re, uh, CT re-imaging after three months of therapy. And that large conglomerate had shrunk down to about uh, two, it was about 2.7 centimeters, I, I, I believe. So he, she had a significant disease reduction after only three months of therapy. So that was really great. Um, and she's been on a acalabrutinib since, and she's doing really well. And, uh, you know, you told me, and it's so common uh, in oncology to hear people talking about short-term goals of things they want to do. They want to go to a wedding, et cetera. <laughs> This lady, I guess, is getting ready to head out to Italy, huh? She is. She re she's been dying to go back, but then the pandemic hit, and that would kind of threw a wrench in her plans. So she came in uh, a couple weeks ago, and she goes, can I go to Italy? I said, pack your acalabrutinib, have fun, <laughs> and wear a mask on the plane. <laughs> I said, go enjoy your life. Um, so she's, uh, she has an exciting coming up, exciting summer coming up. So I'm really, I'm really happy for her. Any uh, other comments about this case, Jennifer, particularly uh, the high risk nature of it? Can you explain what TP53 is, what DEL17P is, and what happens with these patients as opposed to ones who don't have these factors? Yep. So uh, DEL17P is a cytogenetic abnormality where the um, short arm of chromosome 17 is lost. Um, so usually there's going to be two copies of chromosome 17 and one one is one part is lost and this part that's lost encodes a really important tumor suppressor gene called tp53 it's really important in a lot of cancers including cll and so what happens uh, most of the time actually if one copy of tp53 is lost the other copy is mutated and that makes tp53 not function appropriately some people actually will have a mutation without a deletion in the other um, allele of tp53 that's probably just as bad as having both of them, one lost and one mutated. A few people will have just a deletion without a mutation, and that's probably not quite as bad. But this is actually our highest risk scenario in CLL, just like it is in many other malignancies. Um, these people, when in the era of chemotherapy, really didn't have any effective treatments because they don't respond to chemotherapy. Um, they actually don't respond as well to venetoclax-based therapy too. So this is actually the one kind of group of people that we usually will steer towards a BT can inhibitor rather than venetoclax in the frontline setting. And actually, really interestingly, with frontline treatment, there's no difference between people who have a TP53 alteration and those that don't, at least at this point, in terms of progression-free survival. So I was just flashing on the fact that during the pandemic, of course, we did the ONS thing virtually. I can remember one year, I guess it was the first year, where I sat down with, I don't know, 25 oncology nurses. Of, you know, all, we were doing so many things with all different cancers. But I asked one question to all of them, and they all gave the same answer. And the question was, and I, I was just flashing, I think of this lady who comes in thinking she's going to go to hospice, and now she's about to go to Italy, which is, isn't oncology depressing. And I <laughs> guess, Kristen, you guys have a slightly different answer to that question as a, to many other people in oncology. Well, anyhow, let's continue because this next case is right along the same lines. I, I love the story about how this patient ended up getting to see you. This is now is a younger uh, patient, 55-year-old man who works in the financial industry. He has CLL, SLL, just to remind you when we talked in the beginning about, you know, if you think of that graphic between the blood and the lymph nodes, the SLL is more the lymph nodes, the CLL more in the blood. He was more of a lymph node person. What happened with him, Kristen? 
Yeah, he definitely had a more nodal uh, 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 presentation, this gentleman. So he came in, he had established care with us initially because he had developed this symptomatic lymphadenopathy, but he hadn't required, he hadn't met the criteria to require therapy. We told him to come back in three months, but he blew off his uh, appointment because of life obligations, which can happen. Uh, he was busy traveling around. Uh, and then he came back into clinic about nine months after his initial visit. Um, with extensive cervical lymphadenopathy. He had conglomerates up to seven centimeters in his neck, which your neck doesn't have a lot of real estate. So I walked into the room and I felt like his lymph nodes were looking at me. Um, so um, I, I, I asked him, I said, what brings you back into our clinic today? Um, and he said that his boss had told him that his lymphadenopathy was making the clients uncomfortable and he was not allowed to return to work <laughs> until he dealt with his, his cancer. Um, so we happily did that. We went over our treatment options with him and he um, he preferred an MRD driven approach with venetoclaxo benetuzumab, which we happily started for him. Um, he was high risk for tumor lysis because of his disease bulk. Um, I do wanna backtrack though, uh, he, because his uh, lymphadenopathy did progress somewhat rapidly, we did get a PET scan to make sure this wasn't transformed disease. Anytime you had a rapid increase in lymphadenopathy, you want to make sure that this isn't transformed Richter's transformed disease, which can be uh, a much more aggressive lymphoma and a different approach. You have to you have to take a different approach usually with chemotherapy, and the prognosis is usually much poorer than patients with CLL. So we got a PET scan and we wound up um, biopsying his most metabolically active lymph node, which turned out to be, thank goodness, CLL. So we treated him with a venetoclaxo benetuzumab. Um, his course was complicated by an infusion reaction, which is very common. The majority of patients receiving obinutuzumab on the first day will have some form of infusion reaction. He had a fever, he had um, nausea, vomiting, and, um, and significant fatigue. Uh, but we got him through the infusions. Uh, he was able to complete six cycles of obinutuzumab and he completed a year of venetoclax. With venetoclax, we see neutropenia. It's the most common side effect that we see. So we supported him with growth factor, neupogen and neulasta injections as needed. And we got him through that. And then he, was, he achieved MRD undetectability after 12 months of therapy. He's been off therapy for 36 months. He's back at work. He's been allowed back. He's uh, working full time, traveling all over the world and um, he's doing great. I can only imagine what they must be thinking at work. So, uh, Jennifer, any thoughts about the case? And can you explain a little bit more about what Richter's transformation is that Kristen was worried about and she referred to? So Richter's transformation is actually where the CLL transforms um, into an aggressive lymphoma. And usually that is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It can be other types of lymphoma as well though. Um, and so the way, that, the way that this often presents is rapid increase in lymphadenopathy like this patient experienced, and a lot of times people will have really profound constitutional or whole body symptoms that we don't see that often in CLL, or at least we don't see them start very suddenly. So that's things like really profound fatigue, night sweats, fevers and chills without an infection. So whenever we see any of those symptoms or somebody who's LDH, the lactate dehydrogenase is really high. Um, we don't see that very typically in CLL either. We'll get a PET scan and look for areas that are very metabolically active. And if you see that, um, just like Kristen mentioned with this patient, you need to do a biopsy of the most active area and prove that that is in fact CLL. And the reason that that's really important, um, as Kristen mentioned, is because we treat CLL very different than Richter's. We still use many times chemotherapy-based approaches for Richter's, and also people tend to do fairly poorly despite lots of um, you know research that's been done in that area. Um, hopefully, well, that'll change soon. But <laughs> yeah, so this um, patient, you know, is kind of the, the prototype for somebody who really wants a time-limited treatment. He needs quick resolution of his lymph nodes. He needs to get back to work. And, you know, if he's traveling a lot for his job, also probably wants a little bit more freedom than you can get if you have to always be remembering to take your um, pills with you. And there's a really uh, great uh, sort of table in the package insert for venetoclax that talks about uh, how you look at the size of the lymph nodes and the white count to determine the risk <clears throat> or tumor lysis and that even to the possibility of uh, hospitalization. A lot of times when these patients get initially the benetuzumab, that'll reduce the tumor bulk. So by the time they get to the venetoclax, maybe they're not quite as high risk. But Chris, can you talk a little bit, you were kind of referring to it before, but a little more granular uh, detail about 
uh, how you get uh, somebody through a benetuzumab venetoclax. When you sit down with them, you know, you don't want to overwhelm them, but what's the path that you sort of put in front of them? Well, I often lean on my office practice nurse. We make a calendar because it's it's just like they're they're it's it's a lot of information and patients patients tend to be more visual. But I basically tell them it's uh, you know three months of weekly, um, sometimes twice a week appointments that they have to come in for um, you know a, a LIP appointments, uh, lab monitoring. Um, and IV hydration in order to get them through, depending on their disease bulk. Um, <clears throat> the venetoclax uh, ramp up is done over five weeks and they usually have to come in twice weekly. Um, the first day is a longer day. They come in the morning, we clear them with their labs and make sure there are no uh, electrolyte abnormalities. We're looking for something called tumor lysis syndrome. So if you, um, what happens when this, um, it, like when we give venetoclax, like Dr. Wojak said before, it, venetoclax works a little bit too well and it causes rapid cell death of CLL cells. And when that happens, they release their contents into the blood. So you can see elevations in potassium, uric acid, phosphorus, um, <clears throat> and, and, and a rise in your, L, uh, in your LDH levels. And you want to treat this with IV hydration um, and, other, and other medications to help mitigate the risk of tumor lysis syndrome. These patients will also have to be on an anti-uracemic agent, usually a, a cyclovir, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, allopurinol or um, febuxistat, usually started at least three to seven days prior to help mitigate this risk. So it takes a lot of planning to start this regimen. And you can see tumor lysis even with obinutuzumab. And it actually can be quite common because this is when the patients have the most circulating disease is when they get that first split dose at 100 milligrams of obinutuzumab. So it's really important to do tumor lysis labs after you get them through that first infusion on day one and day two, but specifically day one. Um, so it takes a lot of planning. You have to prepare patients for that potential of infusion reaction, and you have to prepare them that, you know, there is a small chance that if they do have evidence of tumor lysis, this is an oncologic emergency, and you may need to be admitted for overnight monitoring um, in, in our, you know, in our emergency department um, if there's significant evidence of it um, because it can only worsen and lead to, it could even lead to uh, death if, in, if, if, if untreated. So um, preparing patients for this regimen, but you know, essentially once you get past this five week ramp up, um, it's usually uh, much easier to tolerate this regimen and the reward is coming off therapy for hopefully many years to come after for a, a prolonged treatment for remission. Jennifer, any comments? I know uh, at Ohio State you piloted uh, trying to do the ramp up quicker. You have a lot of patients who have to travel to Ohio State. Uh, in what situations do you do that? Also, as uh, seen here on this slide, what about interactions with uh, drugs and food? Why do they have to avoid grapefruits, Jude? <laughs> um, yeah, so actually the grapefruits is um, the case with both venetoclax and the BTK inhibitors. So they all um, interfere with um, CYP3A4 metabolism. Um, and so using like grapefruit juice, star fruit, uh, a few others that I'm forgetting off the top of my head right now can actually increase the concentration of the drugs. Yeah, not uh, Seville oranges, not regular oranges. Right, Seville um, Like the oranges, marmalade right. oranges, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, that got me off track and I forgot the first question, sorry. You well, had we, asked about- too. Unless Christian- uh, uh, you, I think you just highlighted drug-drug interactions, which we were kind of uh -huh. uh, hitting on. Um, oh oh yeah, anti, anti-fungals. Kristen oh. wins the memory award. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's hard when you're on the spot. Yeah. I have a funny, I, I had a guy, gentleman who I started on venetoclax based therapy and his favorite cocktail was blood red orange juice and uh, vodka. And we had to stop that. I said, oh, okay. Um, so it's good to do a, a good detailed assessment, uh, especially a nursing assessment to make sure that they know about these drug interactions because that can be, be become problematic. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've never even heard of Seville oranges before, but I actually met one, per one patient once who would get a crate of Seville oranges once a year and had to um, stop that during the time that they were on treatment. Yep. <laughs> now, now I'm going to have to try Seville oranges and yeah. see how they taste. All right, one more, <clears throat> one more case. And this kind of gets into, you know, uh, fortunately, most patients between uh, BTK inhibitors and venetoclax do well for a long, long time and die of other things. Um, but there are people who progress after receiving both of these therapies, and uh, uh, that relates to this next case we're going to hear about, a 66-year-old Cuban woman who was initially diagnosed in 2008. She actually got the ben uh, chemotherapy, so in 2008, bendamustine rituximab was probably 
I think the most common therapy at that point. She then got a BTK inhibitor, Ibrutinib. She got the Murano regimen, which is venetoclax, in the, uh, but instead of a benetuzumab, rituximab, that was used in the recurrent setting, and then was put on uh, maintenance of venetoclax. I guess a lot of concern about her. Can you talk a little bit about what it's been like to take care of her? I know you were telling me that she does not trust uh, the medical community too much. Yeah, she's a, I love her, um, but she can be very challenging to care for. Um, when she presented to us, it took a while for us to get her on therapy because she was having evidence of disease progression following the BR and um, then the mesenrotoxin. And um, she was very untrusting of us. And she had Googled how much these novel agents cost, you know, um, BTK inhibitors and venetoclax are very, very expensive. And we were working with our patient financial services to get her, um, uh, a, you know, a, a, copay assistance, but she had to submit her, um, you know, her documentation of income, and she was very hesitant to do that. So um, that kind of delayed a lot, and she had um, some significant disease progression during that time. So we actually had to go ahead, go ahead and temporize her disease with uh, obinutuzumab monotherapy just to kind of, uh, you know, um, temporize her while we figured out what our next steps are going to be. Um, she unfortunately progressed eight months after her last dose of the obinutuzumab, and it was then we were able to kind of um, convince her to start a BTK inhibitor, and we decided to go ahead and and treat her with a brutinib-based therapy. Um, <clears throat> again, we had some significant delays with her wanting to start. She had wanted to go on a trip. She wanted to travel, and she didn't want to start before then. Um, so then um, she had significant uh, lymphocytosis, and then we imaged her, and we found that she had some uh, significant uh, lymphadenopathy in bulk. Um, so we actually, this is one of our patients. We had to add an anti-CD20 uh, monoclonal antibody rituxin, like Dr. Wojak mentioned before, because to temporize her disease while we controlled it with the abrutinib-based uh, abrutinib therapy. Um, she eventually um, had intolerance to abrutinib. We had a dose reducer to 280 milligrams, and then she had disease progression. We've since started Murano therapy, and she's been in a remission since. Um, she did acquire a TP53 mutation, so she has a higher risk genomic uh, profile. So because of that and how proliferative her disease has been historically and our, and our roadblocks to getting her on new therapies, we've decided to keep her on a venetoclax-based maintenance therapy, whereas Verano was studied, at, you would stop after two years of venetoclax-based therapy. Because she's kind of unique and has such aggressive disease, we're going to keep her on for now and monitor her really closely. So um, she was, she's definitely a challenging patient to take care of, but I, um, I do enjoy her and um, so far she's been um, able to we've been able to keep her in remission for at least two years with the venetoclax based therapy. So I want to finish out and ask Jennifer to talk a little bit about what some of the options might be for this woman if she does develop a progressive disease. Mm -hmm. But first, uh, just to comment also, you know, oncologists are always adding stuff. And so, of course, you know, you think about adding BTK and venetoclax and there are a whole bunch of trials now. Uh, here's a trial that looked at ibrutinib plus venetoclax. Uh, another trial uh, also looking at ibrutinib and venetoclax. But also we're seeing trials, uh, Jennifer, with the second generation agents plus uh, uh, venetoclax. Uh, Zanabrutinib uh, is being studied as well as acalabrutinib. You've done work on, uh, you just presented some work at the ASCO meeting on this. Well, any thoughts about the idea of combining you know, both? You, these are usually time-limited therapies, so you're kind of, to me, it's like you're taking the venetoclax approach and adding on a BTK. On the other hand, you might say, well, maybe in the long run, the patient will do better if you just do one thing first and then follow up uh, with the second. Any thoughts about where this might be heading, Jennifer? Yeah, so the idea of combining BTK and BCL2 inhibitor is, is really, like, very scientifically exciting. Um, and patient exciting too. So, you know, there is a lot of synergy actually between BTK and BCL2 inhibitors. Um, and we know that with venetoclax obinutuzumab or venetoclax rituximab, it's people who have very low genomic risk disease that are the ones that go five plus years without needing retreatment, and people with higher disease risk tend to recur relatively quickly. And so, you know, conceptually, that this idea is great. So you have a drug, a BTK inhibitor that works really well in high-risk disease. You have a drug like venetoclax that can allow fixed duration of treatment. They're both pills. 
let's give them both together. And lots of studies have shown really phenomenal results combining these very high rates of undetectable minimal residual disease. Almost everybody responds. They tend to be relatively well tolerated. Um, right now, none of them are FDA approved. I don't think anybody would really consider these standard of care regimens right now. Because right now we don't have data yet to say that these, this type of combination is better than using venetoclaxo benetezumab, for example. Most mostly the follow-up just isn't long enough to prove that yet. From in most cases, um, and as well you mentioned, we don't really know whether it's better to use both of our classes up front, even though there's a potential you could retreat people with this regimen, you know, if they're off therapy for a while, you could probably do the same thing again, or is it better to do them in sequence? Um, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, the remission durations are so long with these regimens, I don't know that we're ever going to have an answer to that because that study of doing a sequence versus the two of them together is likely to take 20 years <laughs> and we'll have new drugs by then. And, you know, also you're layering in the potential toxicity of the BTK inhibitor that, you know, can be problematic. So uh, I thought there wasn't going to be any other option that was going to work in terms of BTK, but then along came pertubrutinib, and, and Kristen has so much experience with some of the major, a lot of the patients who were treated with this initially uh, were at Memorial. Actually, it just got approved, but in uh, mantle cell where, of course, BTK inhibitors are also used, that's another story. I imagine it's going to be approved in CLL. Uh, we've talked about so-called waterfall plots. As you remember, each one of these bars is a patient. If it goes down, that means the tumor or the white count is going down. If it goes up, it means it's getting worse. And you see something like this. And uh, the thing that's really amazing is you see a lot of these patients had had a prior BTK inhibitor, and despite the fact uh, they still responded to this new type of therapy, any thoughts? Do you think of this patient, uh, Jennifer, she does progress, would be a candidate for a pertubrutinib if you could access it? And what's coming down the pike? I know there was some data just presented at the big annual ASCO meeting on CAR T therapy in CLL. How, do, how would that factor into a, maybe this uh, patient's uh, future? Yeah, so this patient would definitely be a great candidate for pure tibrutinib. This is, you know, prim the primarily the group that it was studied in, people who had had a BTK inhibitor, many people had had a BCL2 inhibitor. We know it's really effective in those patients and very, very well tolerated because it is a very selective BTK inhibitor. Um, so certainly that would be an option. Actually, there is some uh, data you could combine those two pathways together like we just talked about. You know, maybe if she progresses on the venetoclax, you could even add in a BTK inhibitor back to that and get some period of remission. Those are some standard approaches, but I would highly recommend um, if they weren't already being treated at MSK, um, if they're being treated in the community setting, actually referring them for a clinical trial when that time comes, um, just because all of these options after BTK and BCL2 inhibitors do have relatively short um, uh, remission durations. And then CAR T cells, you mentioned, another extremely exciting paradigm in CLL. FDA approved, obviously, for many other malignancies, not not FDA approved yet in CLL. So that's something, again, that could be accessed in the form of a clinical trial and, you know, has the potential, too, to give people a very long-term um, disease and treatment-free time. So, uh, Kristen and uh, Jennifer, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and uh, sharing your experience and uh, wisdom with us. Audience, thank you for attending. Coming back next Tuesday, we'll hear how, what Dr. Garcia Monero and Solomon have to say about high-risk MDS and where it's heading. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Kristen. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>